Presence of Square meets Program Obfuscation by Boas Barak, Zvika Brakerski and Ilan Komagotsky, and Pravesh Kotari, and Ilan is going to give the talk. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. I'm Ilan, and I'll talk about limits on low degrees of random generators. This is joint work with uh, Boas, Zvika, and Pravesh. Uh, so even though this talk is in the obfuscation session, uh, I will barely talk about obfuscation. Uh, I won't even define it but I'll mostly talk about pseudorandom generators. So what is a pseudorandom generator, or in short, a PRG? So a PRG is a function that expands n bits to m bits. Uh, we will denote it by g, so g goes from n to m, and it's convenient for this talk to, talk, to think about uh, each output bit as a function. So g sub i will just be the function that gets the x bits the x bits in the input, the n bits in the input, and outputs a single bit, 0 or 1. So g sub i goes from n to 1, and g goes from n to m, and it's a collection of m functions, g sub i. The pseudo-randomness of uh, a PRG, or the security of this primitive, is defined by saying that any computationally bounded adversary cannot distinguish a g on a random seed versus a, a really uniform string of length m. This is the security definition. It's a basic primitive in cryptography. Uh, it's the basic building block in constructing uh, pseudorandom functions, the GGM construction. And we also know that assuming one-way functions, we can build a PRG with arbitrary polynomial stretch uh, by the Hill construction. <coughs> so this is really one of the basic uh, cryptographic primitives that's used everywhere. And uh, a natural question, given that this is such a basic primitive, is how simple can this primitive be? What do I mean by simple? So there are many ways to define simplicity of a primitive. Specifically for a PRG, one way to think about it is just saying, what's the circuit size that computes it? Second one, what's the depth of the circuit? And there may be more. So one central notion of simplicity that was considered uh, in uh, the past two decades is something called locality. What is a local pseudorandom generator? So it's the same thing. It's a function that maps from n bits to m bits, but it's simple. In what sense? Each output bit, so each such function, g sub i, is a local function. So g sub i doesn't really look at all the n input bits, but it only looks at these specific ones. So there is a mapping uh, that we'll call i sub i that maps the indices that are relevant for g sub i in order to compute g in the i's output bit. So this is a local pseudorandom generator. Uh, what do we know about them? Do they exist? Do, don't they, maybe they don't exist. Uh, what's the trade-offs? Can we get a, an arbitrarily small d uh, with an arbitrarily large expansion? All of these questions are of central interest, both due to uh, practical implications, because these are really uh, easier to, to design PRGs, and they have lots of uh, theoretical uh, applications that we'll discuss. So we have positive and negative results about this primitive. The positive results are summarized as follows. If you assume that one-way functions are in NC1, namely there exists an, a one-way function computable in uh, bounded depth, then there is a local pseudorandom generator with constant locality that expands from n bits to n plus n to the epsilon, or some small constant epsilon. This is Apple from 2006. The second result is actually not uh, a, a real construction, but it's a candidate, a very generic approach towards constructing uh, lo uh, local pseudorandom generators. It was initiated by Goldratt in 2000, and it's a family of assumptions or candidates saying that, look, maybe it's plausible that the f there is a construction that maps n to some specific polynomial, think about it like n squared, that has only constant <coughs> locality, and it is a pure G. So Goldratt suggested that, th that this function may be one way, but follow-up work suggests that actually it even might be pseudorandom. We also have negative results. The negative results are the following. If you want the locality 2, there's actually nothing you can do. There's not a PRG that expands even by a single bit. 
If you want locality three, Krein and Milderson show that you can have only linear stretch. Namely, you can stretch n bits to maybe two n bits, but not much more than that. For d equals four, same thing. That's Moser et al. And most, most surprisingly, for, uh, for general d, they gave a, an upper bound on how much the pure g can stretch. They show that it's at most something like, two to, like n to the d, n to the d over two. That's the best you can hope for, for a local PRG with locality D. And as I said, this primitive has tons of applications. So here are just three of them. One application is a very efficient construction of public encryption schemes. That's upper bound in 2010. Later, uh, they were also used to construct efficient MPC protocols. And most relevant to this work, is the recent work, is the recent line of works uh, of constructing indistinguishability of obfuscation from this primitive. So I won't really tell you what IO is. All you need to know is the following bit. It's our dream. If we can get it, we will solve all of our open problems and we can all go home. So the, the theorem that Lin proved, Lin and Anand and Sahai, in, uh, roughly two years ago, is that this magical primitive that we all hope exists can be based on the following two assumptions. The first assumption is that there is a local pseudo-random generator with locality D that maps n bits to n to the 1 plus epsilon. The second assumption is another creature that we'll call degree D multilinear maps. I will not define that, but just remember that for D equals 2, this is what we all know and love called bilinear maps. So let's see what's the implication of this theorem. So first, let's just plug in d equals 2 and see what happens. So on the one hand, we have bilinear maps. We have candidates. We believe that they're secure in some sense. We're fine. Unfortunately, as we saw, there's no PRG with such stretch. What about d equals 3 or 4? The situation is even worse. Not only there's no such PRG, but we also don't have satisfying candidate multilinear maps, three or four multilinear maps. So we have to go for d equals five. We don't, but even there, we don't have candidate multilinear maps, but we do have PRGs. So that's that. So the situation is not so good. So this is uh, where you think things uh, are, uh, things end. But luckily, we have the beautiful work of Lina Tassaro from last year showing the following result. It's actually the same thing as the previous one. There's an extra word, block, locality D. So they show that IO exists, exists based on the following two assumptions. Again, degree D multilinear maps and a PRG with the stretch, the stretches n bits to n to the one plus epsilon with the property that is D block local. What is block locality? So it's the same thing as locality, except now the inputs to the PRG are not bits, but are actually, you can think about it, as coming from a large alphabet, sigma. So now the PRG maps from sigma to the n to 0, 1 to the m. And uh, one convenient way to think about it is that each block is not a symbol in an alphabet, but actually b bits. So the alphabet is of size 2 to the b, and each block is of size b bits, and the, the locality means that each output bit depends only on a few blocks, but inside the block it can, do, it can do whatever it wants. So in terms of locality, the locality of this thing is pretty big, because you can touch 2 to the 2b inputs on every output. So what Lin and Tessaro needed is a PRG with block locality uh, 2, that, or D in general, that maps n times b bits, because this is the size of your input now, to 2 to the 3b times n to the 1 plus epsilon. This is what they need for their construction uh, in order for it to work. And their observation is uh, that all the lower bounds that we had of Mosel et al. and Kran and Milterson do not apply. As far as we know, when they wrote the paper, this primitive might even exist for d equals 2, which is kind of spectacular because it will imply I from bilinear maps. 
So our results in a nutshell are that the, this primitive does not exist for the equals two. So you need a different approach to construct IO from bilinear maps. <laughs> and we also have maybe a positive result that we believe that this primitive actually exists for d equals three, meaning that the only thing between us and IO is the three linear map, which sounds not so hard. So here's our results in slightly more details. So we have a, a couple of attacks, <coughs> uh, depending on the, on the model. The strongest result, or the hardest model, is the first line in this, uh, in this table, saying that if your pure G stretches from n times b bits to 2 to the 2b times n bits, then no matter what predicates you use, no matter what underlying graph you have, and no matter if the predicates are different or equal, this pure G will be broken. We have an algorithm that distinguishes, distinguishes random from the output of the pure G. If you relax the predicate to be the same on all output bits, so these GIs are the same for every I, then we can even have a better attack and rule out such a PRG even with stretch 2 to the B. And if you allow us, that if you think that the predicate will be random, the graph will be random, and you allow different predicates, then uh, we can also rule out 2 to the B, 2 to the B stretch. And so these are the results. Uh, so this is, all of these results are, uh, the first one breaks, the, the, already breaks the assumption of Lin and, Lin and Tessaro, and the second ones are uh, with better parameters, but we don't know how to get IO from this range of parameters. I'll talk about it in the summary. So as a bonus, we also give a candidate, a very simple and appealing candidate for a three block local PRG, with, with very small block size, just of one, and polynomial stretch. So you can look at the paper for more details about that. So these are our results. In the rest of the talk, I'll give you an overview of how we achieved the first result, but not with 2B, but with 3B. So this will be enough to show you the main ideas. I should also mention that the, 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 the second result was also obtained uh, independently by Lombardi and Lagutanathan in TCC last year. Okay. So we're going to break a PRG, right? So what's the game in a PRG? Uh, there's an adversary that gets G to the random or uniform and it's to distinguish. <coughs> what does it mean to distinguish? It should output uh, the, out the probability that it outputs one on the image of a PRG should be uh, non negligible noticeably uh, different than the probability that it outputs one with, if you sample the input from the PRG and not from uniform. So this is the game, of the pseudo-randomness game. We will actually do something even harder than that. We'll break it even stronger, even in a more strong, strong sense, in a stronger sense. We'll do something we call image refutation. What is image refutation? We will require the adversary, or this is what we will actually achieve, to, on inputs from the from the image of the PRG, we'll always say one. We'll just always say one by default on all images of the PRG. But if the, uh, the input comes from the uniform distribution, we'll say one only with very small probability. You can think about it as sort of a one-sided analog of uh, student randomness. So this is what we're actually going to do. And as I said, this is stronger than distinguishing, because just think of Z as the uniform distribution, this is much stronger. We identify the elements that are not in the image. And another upside is that we can actually handle pre-processing on the inputs because we're doing image refutation. This is actually useful for uh, Lin and Sarah's paper, they actually used it. So it's actually another uh, advantage for us. So here's the proof idea will work in two steps. The first step, what we're going to do, we're going to take our block local PRG and we're going to massage it to get a sparse, low degree uh, polynomial where we think of it as an algebraic polynomial. 
and not not uh, not as a function as a boolean function. So we'll take a block local PRG, we're going to massage it and get a sparse uh, algebraic uh, polynomial with low degree. That's what we're going to do. Once we do that, we have a, a polynomial which is sparse. It has uh, only s monomials, let's say. And this is just a collection P1 to Pm of polynomials. Each of them has low degree. And this is the polynomial that we get. What we're going to do, we're going to compute this program. We're going to compute val, which is the maximum over, you go over all inputs x, and you look at the sum xi, uh, zi, given an input z. This is the input you want to decide whether it's in the image of the PRG or just random you're going to uh, compute the following program. You're going to find the maximum x, the x that maximizes the sum of zi, this is the i to bit of z, times the polynomial, dice polynomial di on the input x. We're just going to maximize this uh, uh, computation. Let's assume for a second we can do it pol in polynomial time. I will explain how we do it in a second. A priori, it seems like it takes exponential time because you have to go over all x. But we can actually do it in polynomial time. I'll show you in a minute how. <coughs> Assume that we do these two steps. I claim that we're done. Why? If z is in the image of the PRG, it's going to be the, going to be the case that val is large. If we're not in the image of the PRG, with high probability, it's going to be small. So we'll only look at the value of val. If it's high, we'll output 1. If it's low, we'll output 0. This is the algorithm. Super simple. So let's see first step 2. So we're given uh, an input z. And we need to decide whether the, uh, the value of val is large or small. Let's see why this is enough. So assume for a second that the polynomial is sparse, because we said we'll have a transformation that will result with a sparse polynomial. So the first observation, if x, if z is indeed the image of the PRG, there is some x that maps to it, right? That x will satisfy the following. If you plug in this x, pi of x is equal to zi. So you get that this sum is just the sum of zi squares, which is m. So z is plus minus 1, just for simplicity, instead of writing things in the exponent. So the sum will be m if this is in the image of the PRG. If it's not in the image of the PRG, what we have is a sum uh, that we can use concentration qualities to prove that it, uh, it has good concentra concentration. Namely, we have a sum of random values, plus minus 1s, times this uh, pi of x if z is random. If z is random, so some of them are plus, some of them are minus, most of them will cancel out. And you can use Chernoff to show that this sum is bounded by the square root of n times s times m. So n is the input size, m is the output size, and s is the number of monomials, which is just used to bound the highest value of pi. This is a, a, a Häufling bound for non-Boolean random variables. So you see, when z is in the image of the PRG, we get m. When z is not in the image of the PRG, and it's somewhat random, we'll get, uh, with high probability, something like square root of n times s times m. Yeah. So this is enough for us, because if m is bigger than uh, n times s, we'll have a gap. And we'll just check it and decide. So this is the step number two. How do we compute this uh, program? So let's see. So this is where we use SOS, sum of squares. We're just using it in the black box. We're using a result of Charcard and Weird, the Charcard and Weird, uh, that says that you can take any degree two polynomial and look at this value, which is the maximum of a uh, piece of x. You can approximate it up to a logarithmic factor. This is a generic result that you can efficiently approximate any such degree to polynomial uh, up to a log n factor. So this is what we're going to use. I'm not going to talk about this logarithmic factor. It just goes into the uh, stretch of the PRG 
I'll just ignore that in the rest of the talk. So this is how we do step two. How do we do step one? So remember, what we're trying to do is to take a block local PRG and translate it into a sparse polynomial with low algebraic degree. A priori, as I said, you, you might think it seems like it's, it won't work because if you take a two block local pure, uh, any function, any two block local function, when you look at it as a polynomial, the degree of the polynomial is huge. It's two to the two b. So what we're going to do, we're going to pre-process x. That's why I said pre-processing is important for us. We're going to pre-process x in the following way. We're going to look at any, uh, any block of size b and just expand it out, tensor it out, tensor it out, and, think, and, and define a new x prime on two to the b times n variables, where you can think of each variable as like an indicator function of which uh, b bits you had in the input. So we will take x, which is of size n, we'll expand it to x, which is of size 2 to the b times n, and we'll work with this PRG, with this modified PRG. So this is what we're doing. And now you can say, you, you, it's easy to observe that if you started with block locality L, then you'll end up with algebraic degree L, and not more. And the number of monomials in G, in G is not too big. It's only 2 to the 2p. But you might, you might think there's a caveat. We, we pre-processed uh, the input. So maybe the new pure G, G prime, is not really a pure G. Because once you, give, uh, you feed G, G prime with a random input, it's not like applying G on a random input. But this is where our image refutation kicks in. Because, and yeah. The image of G prime, if, the, if you think about it for a second, is contained in the image of G. And our refutation says that on strings which are in the image, we will always output one. Only on the outside, we will output zero with high probability. So this is where uh, we use the fact that we are doing image refutation. Okay. So overall, what we got, plugging in uh, plugging in the parameters that I just described in the construction. So if you remember, it was n times s times m. So it's 2 to the 2b, which is the sparsity. And the new n is 2 to the b times n. So we showed that m must be at least 2 to the 3b times n. Okay. Let me summarize and leave you with two open questions. So to summarize, uh, it seems like we ruled out uh, plausible constructions of I.O. from degree two uh, block local PRGs. Uh, there are two very nice questions. The first one, we didn't really get the tightest result we hoped for. We didn't really get two to the b times n in the worst case, worst case, different case. So this is open. And it also leaves some room for <laughs> playing in the constructions of I.O. If you can do, if you can construct I.O. from this small stretch. And the second question, which I find really interesting, is come up with new ways of constructing I.O. It seems like we've almost exhausted one path. Let's find new ideas. So that's it. Questions? So this, this object that you can come up with at the end is polynomials that you said that maybe they are not a PRG, but uh, actually the, the, um, the image of the, the PRG is included in them. So what, what are they exactly? Maybe they are interesting, interesting objects in themselves. They could be used maybe instead of a PRG. I don't know. Do you have an idea? What can you repeat the question? Like these polynomials that you constructed at the end, you said they might not be a PRG. Yes. But uh, like what they are, maybe they are interesting in themselves, uh, like for some other. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. And, uh, and uh, well, I have a question about like this block size uh, PRG. So, uh, what are they um, like? For example, the, can the blocks be uh, overlap? Like, would that make sense, or is it like inevitable? Uh, so, for the construction from I.O., 
we need a real locality and not overlapping blocks. Uh, so we need real locality like I defined it. If you can do it from a relaxed notion of pure genes that have some sort of, uh, that would be great. But, uh, so in terms of the original, did, did you have a question? So it depends how you define the overlapping blocks. What's the overlapping, how much they overlap. So we didn't analyze it. Uh, I think it's a good way maybe to overcome our lower bounds. Yeah. No. In terms of the original motivation for locality, so uh, I'm just wondering, like, okay, locality was supposed to help you do some, like, for the implementation of the PRG? I don't know, like, intuitively, uh, if, like, we, if we go from locality to deep block locality, to, to block locality, is that this does become a different, a different assumption, so I don't know, it depends on the size of the block, so I don't know, like, if this notion of deep block locality, for example, could be used in the same type of applications as the normal locality. I, su I assume it could. Yeah, I assume it could. Okay, another quick question. Yeah. Ah. 